do not use your standard flow down document. I have seen it with a lot of large companies where you have just a boilerplate document and you send it across and it's literally the entire federal acquisition regulations. Make sure that you're first looking at clauses that are mandatory to flow down. Welcome to the Optimize Podcast, brought to you by Visible Thread. The Optimize Podcast is your go-to source for expert insights on BD, capture, proposal management, and government contracting. Each series is hosted by an expert in the field, bringing their unique experience and strategies to every episode. We're excited to have Marsha Watson as our host for this series. Marsha is a proposals operations expert who has led teams to grow contract wins from $600 million to over $2 billion. With years of experience, Marsha and her guests are here to help you navigate the complexities of all things GovCon. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on wherever you are listening. Now let's join Marsha on this episode. Hello and welcome to the Visible Thread Optimize podcast. I'm Marsha Watson, CEO of BTW and Company. In this webinar today, we're going to explore the multifaceted risks involved in government contracting, including compliance, competitive teaming, cost considerations, and the unique dynamics within the Department of Defense procurement process. And if that weren't enough alliteration, let's see what else we can get into the combo today. I'm thrilled to have an esteemed panel of experts with us today. Ryan Connell is the Chief Digital and Artificial Intelligence Office Strategic Operations Chief Acquisitions and sits on the board of the National Contract Management Association Boston Chapter. He'll provide insights from the DOD perspective. Hi, Ryan. How's it going? Thanks for, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Dr. Dolores Cucina Mussina, CEO and founder of Rexota Solutions. She will offer perspectives on teaming and capture strategies as related to the federal acquisition regulation or the FAR as we know it. Hi, Dolores. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And Kyle Peterson, the Vice President of Accounting and Strategy for Customer, su- customer Success for Visible Thread. There's that alliteration again. Kyle's going to shed light on compliance and risk management from a contracting officer's perspective, and he's no stranger to Visible Thread webinars and podcasts. Good to see you, Kyle. Hey, Marsha. I've actually had the privilege of being on webinars with all or parts of this group before. This is our first time getting the whole gang together, so I'm, I'm pretty fired up. So happy to be here. Yeah, this has been an exciting opportunity for me as well to get to work with this group. So thank you. And so last but not least, Jeff Shapiro, Government Contracting Advisory and Regulatory Assurance Partner at Cone Resnick, focusing on compliance and risk management in federal contracting. Jeff, (laughs) what a job you have. Welcome to the crew. I am thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right, guys, let's dive right in. Let's go straight to compliance because that's where it always starts. So let's discuss compliance topics, focusing on the DCAA, the Defense Contract Audit Agencies, and and the approved contractor system that that businesses need um, as they continue to grow in, in federal contracting. This includes estimating, purchasing, and accounting practices. And compliance in government contracting is so critical for ensuring that approved contractor systems are effectively implemented, verified, documented and maintained. Kyle, can you elaborate on the importance of having these systems in place and how they relate to compliance audits? What should contractors be aware of regarding documentation and applicability? Yeah, it's it's a great question. It's a big question, Marsha. So I'll, I'll certainly dive in, but happy to have any of my colleagues here kind of fill in the blanks. Um, so at a high level, kicking things off, before I joined Visible Threat, I was a contracts manager in the aerospace industry. So kind of sitting between the nexus of prime flowdowns and then also working with those subcontractors, that's all affected by these systems, estimating, purchasing, and accounting. So the way I would kick things off and also bringing in my kind of customer success software adoption experience to this, it's all about processes, policy, and people. Um, so pick one of those favorite systems. You know, in theory, the requirements are fairly straightforward. The hard part is actually the implementation, documentation of processes, and maybe most importantly, training. Training of your people, whether they're contracts, whether they're subcontracts. Do people know how you conduct price analysis? Do people know how you make commercial item determinations and how do you document it? Where do you save that documentation? I Generally, I see kind of misses there. 
Um, and so these CPSRs, I was recently at an event uh, about a month or so ago, um, and one of the speakers said he generally sees companies fall down in CPSRs on the subcontracting side on those sole source contracts. Have we adequately justified that sole source decision? Um, and that goes back to documentation, policy training, and also, dare I say, avoiding complacency. Well, you know, we've had this subcontractor with us for years. We're just going to take their historical pricing tack 3% on. There you go. Is that good enough? No. Um, mm-hmm. So I'd maybe start there um, and I could go on longer. I'll pause. Uh, but that's where really I look at it. What data is required? Where do people store it? How do they do this consistently? Um, for each contract, and then when you have to defend yourself in an audit. Uh, but I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, Jeff, do you want to add any more detail to kind of what that process includes, especially for uh, contractors who might not understand the implementation implications of, of the systems uh, estimating per, uh, accounting and um, purchasing? Sure, there lots of different areas to cover here, but the importance is, you know, the types of contracts that you're working on. If you're chasing cost reimbursable contracts, you have to have an approved accounting system. And it's always critical that, you know, while the criteria are set aside, uh, if you're doing work with DOD within the DFARS, uh, those criteria are, 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 were made for a reason uh, and, you know, maybe revised here in the uh, semi near future, but knowing that it's critical that all those processes are fit to what's practicable for your business. You shouldn't have to reinvent yourself uh, from an accounting standpoint to make the DCA auditors happy. So what does that really mean? You still have to make uh, decisions uh, within your business. You know, you need to make a profit. You need to understand what, what projects are going well or not going well. All can be done within all the various criteria listed in, in those deep bars. So if you're chasing cost reimbursable contract, understanding how that fits in with the, with your software package and, you know, know that you can have an account as an acceptable accounting system with something as simple as QuickBooks or something as complex as SAP. Uh, so and everything in between and this bunch of other software packages everyone has heard of. And as you get larger, when you get to $50 million and above is when you got to think about having uh, compliant and, you know, auditable and to your uh, point, you know, well-documented estimating and purchasing systems. You're doing a significant amount of work with subcontractors. You're buying a significant amount of materials. Uh, you're, you're working on lots of single source or lots of change orders. Yeah, you're going to have either a CPSR, a contractor purchasing system review, or you're going you're to have an estimating system audit from, from DCAA. Uh, and all those systems should work within how your company does business. An estimating system is not going to be something you're going to easily buy from a single software package. Purchasing system, same deal. Like uh, like Kyle mentioned, uh, technology, process, people, all part of it. So all may have complex criteria listed in deep bars, but when it comes down to it, it's got to be something that fits your business and you can then demonstrate why you are spending uh, federal money judiciously. Absolutely. And so talk to me a little bit, Jeff and Kyle, about you know, some of the requirements for these systems in terms of compliance, for example, you know, getting three quotes from subcontractors, you know, that that is a workload in and of itself when you need to be compliant with these systems as you're as you're building your teams. We'll talk about teams later, but there's definitely some tripping points in in the requirements for compliance for these systems. Can you dig in a little bit kind of a checklist of let's make sure we're paying attention to A, B and C? Do you want to start, Jeff, or me? Sure, I, either way. So I, to me, it's all about uh, cross-referencing, writing good policies and procedures. You know, that's where you got to start. You got to start with that great tone and saying, hey, listen, we're at ABC Company, are full of integrity. We want to do the right thing when spending our own taxpayer money. And once you start setting that tone, writing down a policy procedures, this is how we're going to do everything. There's not a set manual that fits for every company. I didn't hear that the first time. So... <clears throat> So when you write up those manuals, cross-reference everything to the criteria. But look, this is how I satisfy, uh, you know, uh, you know, making sure that there's the proper anti-lobbying and the and the, and the fire Foreign corrupt practices act and debarment and whatever else on the purchasing side. This is how I segregate allowable from unallowable costs for the accounting system. You know, this mm-hmm. is how <clears throat> I make sure that there's 
significant management reviews on proposals before they go out the door as a you know criteria within the estimating system. You know, cross referencing make it easy for those auditors, make it easy for your own people. And so, like you said, Marsha, training, training, training. Uh, all these systems require that you must train and and continuously review your practices uh, uh, throughout the year. This is this these systems are not meant to be stagnant. They know. Uh, they, meaning the government, understands that your business is under continually change. You're going to get different types of contracts. You're going to have different customers. And, you know, your business is going to have to change with it. And for the policy and procedures to make sure that they continually get updated and to, to uh, follow your updated business practices, very, very important. Kyle, anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I'd say lean on on talented guys and in firms like Jeff. Um, something that I would recommend is um, even something as interesting and simple as kind of going through protests. The Armed Services Court of, of, of Appeals has some really fascinating cases in terms of what not to do, I think can be really instructive. And so you know, maybe I'm no fun at parties, but you know, Sunday morning coffee, go through some of those awards. There's really actually really interesting insights in terms of where people have fallen down. And that can really help say, okay, well, if we can prevent, um, you know, putting my kids' private school education as an allowable cost, that's a good place to start. Now, that's kind of a silly example, but you know, be creative in looking for those sources of information. You know, lean on contracting officers where possible as well. Um, you know, before award, hey, this is what I've got. Am I missing anything? Um, you know, I'm sure Brian might have a story there too. And then maybe just while I have the the floor here, Marsha, that might be a nice segue. I, I was, when we were prepping this, I had a story. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when, when you're going after an effort, you haven't been awarded any contract yet, but you're reviewing those FAR flowdowns, whether it's direct from the government or from the prime. You know, making sure that you're finding all of them kind of and then sorting them in terms of what do we need to do? Um, and then also where are they hiding? So I, I work with a user group where they were reviewing a solicitation and had multiple exhibits. They had their contracts team review kind of the contracts exhibits, maybe section I, section H. Um, but there was a quality kind of addendum that dealt with quality codes, certifications, things like that, that their quality team was diligently reviewing. But there were a couple of FAR clauses that were hidden in that quality addendum that contracts didn't pick up. Quality wasn't thinking to look for them. Um, and so they missed those FAR clauses in that document. They were ultimately awarded the contract. Good. Um, but whoops, those requirements reared their head. So What are we doing to make sure that we're not missing these specific requirements that are flown down to us for a specific effort? Um, And so are we training our people to know what to look for? Are we investing in software to help us identify those across one or 50 documents? That can be sometimes half the battle. What is my customer asking of me for this specific effort? Um, You can have all the systems in the world, but if you're surprised, that's a problem. And the FAR will tell you what you need to do. Um, I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's part of it, you know, making sure the right people are reading the document from their the solicitation and the requirements from their uh, role and responsibility perspective, of course. Right. But also looking at I always I always say this looking out to who's to your left and who's to your right in the process. How is it that your responsibility in that document, your requirements, if you catch something that might lead to contracts or compliance or IT that m- they might also need to look for, you know, as a proposal per- per- professional, excuse me, um, you know, maintaining that overall awareness of big picture what these compliance requirements are is a difficult undertaking for sure. So everybody kind of needs that layman's level of understanding, but you definitely need to have experts looking at these sections and these requirements when it comes to the systems that your corporation and your company are required to be compliant with, you know, the, the risk of, you know, losing your ability to obtain more contracts because you've inefficiently managed your estimating system. Like the irony <laughs> of, you know, being able to do one besets the ability to do the other. Brian, I saw you kind of taking some notes and, and, and nodding your head a little bit. Anything you wanted to add to their testimonials? Uh, first, I think Kyle is fun at parties, so I wanted to just throw that out there. Thanks. All right. Second, uh, Jeff, to double click on something that you said, uh, find it interesting that you brought it up from your perspective in terms of just the, uh, the processes and policies shouldn't be stagnant. Um, 
what was running through my mind at the time was an authority that came out, gosh, I don't know, four or five years ago, uh, allowing primes to buy uh, things under $10,000 as if they're commercial without having to do a SID just because they're under $10,000 as long as they're bought for the purposes of multiple contracts. Um, I've had several conversations with primes. None of them have ever used that authority. And they've said it's just too much work to change like, or to do a waiver to our existing policy. And so that, that resonated with me when you were uh, explaining uh, what you were explaining. Make sure you tell everyone what a SID is, uh, Ryan. I know you lived that life for so long. The commercial item termination. Sorry, Sid. Yeah. <laughs> but that's interesting, right? There, there's, there's an avenue of convenience that becomes inconvenient <laughs> because of the way the policies are written. And again, you know, the, the nature of the human is to take the path of least resistance. I find that so fascinating. Um, anyone anyone want to pull on that string for a second? And then we'll, we'll move to the next topic. Got you covered there, huh? Well, so let's talk about that. So Kyle kind of got us talking about flow down analysis. And for those who might not be entirely sure, flow downs are those government clauses that are required in the prime contract to be distributed downward to subcontractors, which offloads those that work and requirements to the subcontractor or requires an equal level of compliance at the subcontracting level. Um, and, and so that can move obligations and risks off of the prime onto a subcontractor. And, and it's a, an element of management that the prime needs to be aware of, but it's also a, a, a little step back from that area of responsibility understanding that that is a subcontractor requirement. It's been flowed down to kind of a not my problem, your problem type sort of thing. Kyle's story kind of led to it earlier, but Car Kyle, where did you, you had a story about kind of missing those clauses due to oversight. What are, what are the outputs and or implications of, of not paying attention to the appropriate flow down call clauses? Sure. So maybe I'll start from subcontract implications. Let's assume that the FAR that you missed needs to be flown down to any subcontractors. And thus, if you've missed it, you haven't flown it down. That's a problem um, for kind of performance than any post-award audit. Um, you're exposed there. Um, and your subcontractors can't provide anything to you that you don't ask for. So there's really uh, strong implications there. Um, the other thing I would maybe lean on there or touch on is... If you're a prime, maybe I'll speak to primes here, mm -hmm. and you're speaking with your subs, your kind of vendor base, I've seen it maybe all too often that in primes' rightful fear of missing flowdowns, they also just send the kitchen sink downstream. I don't recommend that either, not only because I was a subcontractor, contracts manager having to sift through it, um, but I think that's an overreaction. Um, and you know, you're not helping your subcontractors deliver on time and profitably if you're just throwing the kitchen sink at them just to cover yourself. Um, not only just commercially, but maybe just as a point of principle. Um, so knowing what your customer is asking of you can allow you to tailor and just flow down to your subs what you need to flow down. That will benefit your subs, it will benefit you. Um, uh, it will help you also stand up to any audit as well. Man, we've got a really tight um, process here. And maybe the last thing I would touch on, and I'll, I'll pause again, is, you know, think about systems. Okay, half the battle, finding the FARs. These are all of them in this document. I don't want to do it manually. Um, but then also, a lot of organizations have this. You have internal playbooks. You most likely have policies that speak to, if I come across 52204-2, that's a classified um, kind of documentation uh, requirements FAR. I know what I need to do with it. Here's, do we need to flow it down? Do we need to kind of flag this to our IT and security team? So linking the finding with kind of your policy stance will tee up your contracts teams, your subcontracts team to take timely action as opposed to here's a 100-page contract, figure out what we need to do. Hopefully that was helpful. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that just introduces more risk and, and talking about that that level of risk mitigation um, it takes time. It takes negotiations kind of on a different trail. So especially during the proposal process, if you're trying to get your teaming agreements established during the proposal process and you're just throwing the whole, you know, 
section K, section L, section H over to the subcontract. Now they, and usually that small business, has to take the time to decipher that. So, you know, it's going to eat away your ability to put that proposal in on time. But it's also from an execution perspective, you know, literally creating more risk than there than there needs to be. Um and so again, it's a discipline, it's a training, it's a process perspective inside every organization to understand which clauses flow down, which don't. I mean, there are obviously some that are, are prime applicable. And then in certain situations, you know, whether or not that sub might also need an approved accounting system or that sub might also need their facility clearance level or, you know, those sorts of other simple, simple things that, that seem to be kind of no duh. As a matter of fact, it's just kind of like you have to put your perspectives in that as when is it appropriate? When is it not? Or it's just not, you know, a clause that flows down. So Jeff, Ryan, D- Dolores, anything kind of rings to the top of your head of like, these are definitely clauses that flow down as opposed to these are clauses that don't. Can you maybe short checklist a few things for companies to be on the lookout for in those flow downs? I'll I'll jump at this because um, probably everyone on the call knows this is this is one of my gripes when it comes to doing some contracts. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give the worst answer per usual, which is it depends. Um, when you're looking at your flow downs, you have to know what subcontractors you're working with. So if you're working with a small business or you're working with a commercial uh, company, you have to know what clauses are going to apply to them and be able to sift through to make sure not only are they developing a uh, flow down document that's applicable to the work that everyone is doing, but also to the type of contract or agreement that you're giving to your subcontractors or your team members. And, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, you're not going to give a cost plus uh, contract to a subcontractor that's a small business. They're not going to be able to support that. And in what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to work with them to figure out, is it a time and material? Is it firm fixed price that's going to work better for them? So you have to anticipate what kind of business they want to do with you as well um, and, and make sure that, you know, they're able to still support you from that level. And you should be doing that during the proposal stage. But we know life gets in the way. Sometimes a teaming partner falls apart. So you're kind of trying to figure out what that relationship is later in the game. But make sure that you understand who you're working with. Um, And a lot of times if you're getting to do business with a very small company or someone that's not used to doing work with the government, be ready to explain what all these clauses mean. I have seen countless times small businesses spend so much money on lawyers and not lawyers in government contracting review these clauses. And it just it delays the start of work. It it I. In my opinion, it can also harm the relationship because there's now frustrations on both sides. Why weren't you ready? You know, what is all this legal review? No one likes to hear it's with legal. That means we don't know how long it's going to be there. And I know the lawyers are working hard, but it's one of those things that if you don't have the right people in your corner, and if you don't know what to anticipate from your potential teaming partner or subcontractor, it's very hard for you to make sure that you're keeping a timeline. So anticipate that and anticipate the negotiations. Um, The other part of the, I I would say, best practices is um, make sure that you're first looking at clauses that are mandatory to flow down. Um, Do not use your standard flow down document. I have seen it with a lot of large companies where you have just a boilerplate document and you send it across and it's literally the entire federal acquisition regulations. Um, And my question always is, is this from the prime or is this just your standard form? And if the answer is this is our standard form, then I will just go through and, you know, cross out everything that's, you know, not applicable to the type of work, which takes time. um, But it also, you know, comes back looking like a very ugly document (laughs) to the prime, because just because you you gave me the entire FAR doesn't mean that it's applicable for like a $15,000 purchase order. So just be mindful, I would say, of of the kind of burden that you're putting on your subcontractors and and be willing to explain it. Because if you can't explain it, then you probably shouldn't be flowing it down. Yeah, that's a great point. And again, it's it's training, it's awareness. Um, You know, you don't want to learn these lessons from a legal perspective. It's it's surely, you know, better to, as, as Kyle mentioned, you know, look at what's out there that's been documented where other companies have gotten themselves into hot water because of these these um, pitfalls. 
And so kind of, and that leads me again to, again, it, it does create more risk. If you float all of the clauses down to a small business subcontractor, not only are you overwhelming them, you're probably scaring them. They're not going to be able to pay attention to the risks that actually apply to them because they have, you know, you're trying to boil the ocean with their FAR clauses. But also in response to that, when you get those back, those same nuanced red lines between the true teaming relationship are going to get buried in all the junk that's there. And so, you know, somebody might just go in and blankly accept all changes. And and now you've worked yourself into the opposite situation where you've made a change that is going to issue a, a contract concern. Um, Jeff Ryan, any any antidotes and anti antidotes <laughs> on those situations? Where have you kind of given that real world perspective of, you know, one time this happened and don't let it happen to you? Any of those personal experience and levels of advice from you? Jeff, you have anything? If not, I'll I'll have a I'll add a couple comments. Go to, go ahead and get I can ask. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I can only really speak from like the government to prime perspective, but I assume it's very similar from prime to sub in the sense of like, uh, I mean, a lot of what Dolores said, but just not wanting my uh, potentially unrequired clause to dictate who's going to bid on an effort, right? Like, I, I don't want to shrink the uh, industrial base that might be interested in my requirement just because I'm adding additional requirements uh, that aren't necessary to be added. Right. So I just think that's an important thing to say from at least the government side. And I assume that the prime, I'd like to think primes have that same perspective as they're passing it down to the sub. Well, they should. <laughs> I think that's the important piece of it, because, you know, if there's a clause in there that prevents a prime from being able to bid, you're going to get a question to have that clause removed. Um, you know, and that comes also from shaping requirements. If you're out there far enough and you know what clauses might restrict competition, you know, those are the strategies you should be able to use, not the the reactive, reflective ones. Jeff, did you have anything to add? Yeah. The only thing I was going to add that's then that's just like a non-mandatory FAR clause that should be flowed down, but should be an understanding of or related to changes and termination. Um, I, I've seen lots of companies get in trouble with that. Or the prime you know, gets a significant change from the government or, or unfortunately gets T for C uh, terminated for convenience. And, you know, they need a significant amount of information from the subcontractor in order to get that proposal in. And, you know, if you build that in from the beginning about, you know, when uh, you access the documents and getting the right information on, under a certain timeline, you can point to that contract. Hey, listen, you, you know, we knew this could potentially happen. We, we agreed upon it at the very beginning. And now that it is happening, Hey, I need you to get me your information because so I can properly compensate you if we do get terminated. Uh, so be should be, be be aware of that, and that's not a bad thing uh, to to negotiate in those clauses. That's great advice. It's great advice. Can I jump in there. Yeah, please do. Yeah, no, I figure you might have something to say about that. Jeff just <laughs> sparked the light bulb moment. Yes, in addition, change clauses, terminations, um, stop work orders, especially in light of you know COVID hurricanes, force majeure type events. If you're a sub, be really careful. The prime has to stop it for 90 days. Make sure that they're not trying to extend that, to kind of limit that stop work period to what the federal government offers the prime itself. Um, that's one that can trip people up um, in your best interest to, to kind of take a look at it. And just one other quick thing I would recommend uh, based off of Dolores nailed it in terms of there's certain things we can flow down based on the type of sub we're working with, um, whether they're a small business, um, you know, types of contracts. I would encourage, uh, you, you know, people on the line, reach out to your subcontracts, to your supply chain team. Do we have a matrix of suppliers and teaming partners? You know, who's a small business? Who's cast covered? Um, who has approved business systems? Um, if you have that matrix available, great. That can help you flow accordingly. And if we don't have access to that type of information, that's probably something you guys should work on um, in, in conjunction. It's not just a supply chain problem, um, but that's maybe a, a, an actionable takeaway that I would look into. Maybe you have it. If you don't, I'd recommend you look into it. And that visibility is important, not just for the FAR, but just as, as you being a commercial going concern. Pause. Absolutely, Kyle. And that that has multi use. I mean, you're, you're going to put it in your your accounting system, obviously, so you have the right records of, of your um, actual teaming partners. 
But also that's just going to start being required in your small business participation plans as you grow into a larger business. What access of a supply chain do you have? How can you pull in demographic small businesses to supplement your your um, subcontractor re- requirements? So again, a lot of these activities that we're talking about, they're not just talking about contractual compliance, but they're talking about how you exercise and execute your business um, and and tying them all together, eliminating the contradictions, but also in the convenience of being able to use this data in multifaceted avenues. Um, so I want to segue over to a teaming conversation, but real quick, I just if there's any closing remarks or anything that the team wanted to add when it comes to specifically cost accounting systems and FAR compliance. Did we miss any topics that are important for the conversation today? All right. I'm going to take that as so far so good. And for, for again, for our audience, we do have our Q&A up. We're kind of watching it on the sidebar. Um, some questions we'll answer at the end. But if you have a timely question to the topic, please go ahead and put it in the box and we'll include it in our conversation. Um, so, yeah, let's let's talk about specifically subcontracting and competitive teaming the risks and mitigations associated with establishing teams. We've kind of talked about the contracting relationship there, but from strategy and government contracting, navigating competitive teaming dynamics, you know, how do you get that early awareness of those subcontractor requirements from a statement of work perspective so that you can make sure that you're pulling in the appropriate teaming partners, that they will be compliant to, to these requirements? So Dolores, I know this is kind of kind of your bread and butter area as well. So what should contractors consider when forming teams and specifically about that diverse pool of subcontractors? What are your advantages there? What risks are we mitigating in how we establish these teams? Yeah, I mean, I love this question because I think it 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 definitely helps in you deciding if it's something that you can go after or not. Um, you know, as many of us are looking at a lot of the requests for information that are popping up right now on the industry side, we're trying to determine, hey, is this the type of work that I'm able to support? Is there a compliance issue that I might need to consider? Is this a set aside? Um, meaning, is it going to be, you know, towards a small business or is this going to be for a woman owned small business? You know, what, which way is the government leaning? Um, so as companies are looking at that, and they're looking at their capabilities, if there's some kind of gaps that they have in those capabilities, that should give you a marker of, I need to find a subcontractor. And we all, we are human. We have our favorite people we like to go to to see if they're able to support the effort or if it's something among their capabilities. If not, you know, a lot of people are using LinkedIn to find companies, um, look at some company briefs, websites. There's a ton of tools that also allow for that as well. Um, but in general, when you're trying to figure out who do you want to team with, it, it all starts out with what opportunity are you going after and what is the government leaning towards? Are they leaning towards a set aside or is it going to be a full and open? Is this something that they're looking for non-traditionals to help lead, depending on if it's research and development or prototyping efforts? And then deciding, are you going to be the prime on it or the lead on it, or are you going to be the subcontractor and you're trying to find um, your highest probability of win based on who you're with and what role you're playing. If you've gotten through that decision matrix, uh, then you start deciding on who you're going to go with. And this is where if you're in, entering into unfamiliar territory, this is where you get to test the relationship with with different organizations. See who is, you know, during negotiations, that's that's your first test. So that pesky NDA that us contract managers want everyone to sign before having those conversations, it's really your first test. Um, you know, how willing are they to accept, you know, you wanting to protect your intellectual property? How willing are they willing to accept what you want as dispute resolution or how you want to handle if any information gets, you know, handled improperly? It's your first sign of, do I want to work with this person or not? especially if all of a sudden you get an NDA that's 46 pages, you probably are going to be expecting a very long subcontract or a very long teaming agreement. So it gives you kind of signs from the very beginning. Um, And then you see where there's some synergies. And I think that's where you spend a lot of the time. And that's where a lot of business development folks spend a lot of their time. Um, And you start kind of, I think Kyle talked about it is, creating a matrix for teaming and seeing who can meet those capabilities where you have gaps, 
Where can they compliment you? Where can you where can you split the work? Is it worth for that company for you to subcontract or do you need to hire someone? There's a lot of complexities that goes into teaming, especially when you're deciding, you know, this is the effort I want to go to. Um, and that's where, again, at every stage you do a no bid decision. Like, am I, is it still worth going after? Yes or no? Yes, it's still worth going after. Let me go to the next step. Is it still worth going after? Well, you know, now we're looking at having six teaming partners. This is, we're splitting the pie a little too much. Maybe we say no and we see if someone else wants to lead the effort. So there's a lot of strategy that goes into it. So having a really good uh, BD or capture person that can start that very early, not when the proposal hits or not when the solicitation hits when you're writing the proposal. Do not start then. Start, you know, when you hear about it on the industry day, start when you start getting the pings on LinkedIn of, hey, big announcement, we're going to be posting the solicitation here and here. Um, start then. Uh, look at the budgets, look at the, you know, policy documents when they're talking about some programs that these organ these agencies are going to push out. Um, that's when you start. If you're starting when the draft solicitation's out, that might also be too late because most likely there's already teams that are formed as well. Yeah, and absolutely. And, and again, some of that preliminary advice, you know, I've worked with many different companies. I've worked inside large companies. And a lot of times it's, well, let's see what the RFP says before they make any of those final corporate decisions. That's great for a statement of work, but for the clauses, for the requirements, for the quality control aspects, those are usually, and, and Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, but those are usually almost standardized or at least copied and pasted from um, solicit like solicitation to solicitation with, within that organization. So at the very least, start looking at prior solicitations, similar solicitations to that requirement to see what clauses might have applied or see what compliance or restrictions might be out there before you wait for that RFP. You'll be able to get some good deductive analysis at least to, to determine what that is. Ryan, do you want to correct me or clarify on that? No, I mean, I. Uh, it's hilarious that you bring that up. Uh, never thought about it that way, but I'm absolutely guilty of taking one document and then <laughs> control find and replace with new information and using that to leverage the next one. Um, so that sounds like a, a reasonable strategy based on at least things that I've done on the other side of the fence. Perfect. Well, that's nice. <laughs> Good to hear. <laughs> Kyle, Jeff, any, again, any testimonial? Um, maybe the only thing I would add there, and I'm glad Dolores brought it up. I hadn't thought about it before this morning is data rights and intellectual property. When we talk about risk, when we talk about whether you're working with a teaming partner, whether you're going up to the prime, um, maybe the most valuable asset a company has is its intellectual property. Um, so whether you're breaking out work share agreements with a teaming partner, be really clear in terms of who, own, who owns what, who's developing what, who's funding the development of what, and then that ultimately needs to be kind of driven upstream too. And, you know, do you have the ability to document and prove to the government that, you know, I'm going to assert limited rights on this drawing because we developed at our private expense 20 years ago versus this is a cost reimbursable contract. There's a line that I've been the PWS speaking to this design. Um, make sure that you're asserting correctly, uh, but also confidently to protect that IP. Um, and that starts at the very beginning of the effort as well. You know, you don't want to get until a week before the RFP and, oh, oh shoot, I was going to probably use a stronger word there. <laughs> what are we going to assert here? Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, and, and that found, forms foundations for the actual relationship development of those teaming agreements. If, if you feel like you need to put yourself in a cave to hide your IP, or protect your IP, you're not going to be able to perform with that teaming partner the, the way that you want to. Um, again, anything else to add there? And then, and in that sense, Kyle, the perspective moving to what are the ramifications of, you know, not truly understanding from an ex execution perspective? These can have impacts on your CPARS evaluations, your performance assessments. Um, any, any stories there as far as, you know, We've entered into this and, and you know, um, the issues and concerns with how, how they relate to CPARs. 
Um, I don't know if I have a strong kind of CPAR story that speaks to that. I would maybe just add, um, I know there in my past life, there was a lot of gnashing of teeth internally in terms of how we're literally marking drawings um, with proprietary statements, limited rights assertions, um, what drawings, when can we do it? Um, and then also having kind of spirited debates internally about, oh yeah, no, this is ours. Is it? Um, mm -hmm. So I have kind of more experienced internal discussions, not so much as it relates to CPARs, but ultimately if you're delivering a C drill with incorrect markings, that can of course have an impact on any review that's done of your performance under an effort. Um, so I think it's relevant to, to that point. But if anyone else has a, a more specific story there, I'll, I'll defer to them. Ryan, anything from the acquisitions perspective, kind of flip side of that coin? Have, have you seen those situations unfold that, that put a procurement at risk? Not really. Uh, I was trying to think as you were asking the question. I mean, I think the, the more relevant, or honestly, more relevant, more relevant to me uh, mm -hmm. is uh, how much we're doing with like small iterative contracting that we're not even getting to a point where we have like, oh my God, we have a CPARS issue. It's, it's, it's like six months, did it work, did it not? And then trying something different and continuing to iterate from there. Um, so at CDA, we're doing a lot of experimentation and small little contract efforts that um, I haven't really dove, dove head into um, impact to CPARs yet. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. To be, to be seen, huh? <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So let's switch topics one more time. Let's talk about cost and price in developing our responses to the government. Obviously, again, teaming has great influence there, but also your estimating system, your purchasing system, how you have your infrastructure established in the first place to be able to bid on opportunities. Jeff, this is your wheelhouse. Take it away. Yeah, so many different tops. I, I want to bridge what we were just talking about, and then we can talk a little bit more. So in your teaming arrangement discussions, um, when it comes to competitive uh uh, solicitations, you know, finding a teaming partner that you can trust is, is so important. I know it's, you, you quickly think of the technical side first, but I'm not going to understate, uh, the, the compliance and the costing cost and pricing side as well, because as a former government cost team, uh, lead for a number of, of competitive proposals, I can't tell you how many times we have come very close. If that probably did. Uh, throwing out prime contractors from the competitive range because we receive either in, incomplete uh, sealed packages from subcontractors or completely don't get them at all. And mm -hmm. so how do you work with those stubs to make sure, hey, listen, you know, what are you going to be submitting to the government so we can make sure that there are no questions to to our price or making significant uh, realism adjustments to our price. Uh, you know, most subcontractors aren't going to be willing to share the proprietary pricing information and that's all and good. So you may need to do some homework, uh, looking at other companies who have worked with that sub, uh, say, Hey, listen, ha you know, have you done any competitive bidding with these folks? Have they submitted everything? Have you had any problems? You know, there's nothing wrong with checking references, so to speak. And, and also giving them templates say, Hey, listen, Here's how we're going to present our pricing. I think they'll look really good to have a consistent uh, uh, presentation. I mean, I, I'm guessing, Marsha, you probably do this. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that So the government kind of sees, all right, they're all on the same page. And oh, by the way, does the price for that sub in the prime package match what the subcontractor is putting in its package? I can't tell you how many times that didn't match. You know, why does that happen? You know, as always, pricing almost always comes last. Uh, when it comes to proposal writing, everyone comes up with a new strategy, new approach, a managed manage challenge, uh, so many different things. And then pricing is devolved near the end. That's a huge mistake. Uh, pricing needs to be about from the very beginning so they can raise their hand and be like, hey, listen, if you guys decide to you know, create a PMO for this, pricing people need to know about that. Uh, so, so involving them from the very beginning uh, is, is a very easy best practice. I mean, you as you said, than done. Uh, but you know, if you want to submit something that is justifiable, it'll get you to a place where you submit that realistic, reasonable proposal that the government comes back with, you know, minimal clarification questions and you know, 
follows your your value added proposition, then you're golden. But the more inconsistencies you have, difficulties in explaining bases of estimates, yeah, I, the government is going to have increasing doubt with your ability to perform, even though it has nothing to do with your technical approach. It's just your cost and pricing. Um, and you know anything. You know, remember I, the number one advice I give with submitting on competitive proposals is as of today, it's all 100% people doing the evaluations. And I'm sure at some point, AI is going to take over a little bit and do a, do some com- quick compliance checks. But still, at the, ultimate, at the end of the day, a team of people are going to report back to the, to, the, to the procurement authority to say, hey, listen, you know, we evaluated ABC Company's proposal and this is what we saw. And there's going to be some opinionated language in there. And, you know, even if price and cost is the least important factor when deciding things, you know, if things are close, I think, don't you want that person to say some nice things about your proposal? Absolutely. And congratulations for making it 46 minutes without bringing up AI. Um, <laughs> Darn. Darn it. It's open to make it the whole time, but it, it plays a part. Now there's advantage on the front end and the back end. That's, that's a whole other topic for a whole other day. Um, Dolores, what's your insight on some of that from, again, that, that teaming construct as, as you started talking about establishing those relationships? I found it in prior history, for example, when you have a, a key subcontractor that is supplying you know, a major response to the technical proposal, one of the things that they will love to do, especially if it's a large business that's played this game before, is hold that technical content until they get that teaming agreement written. And then they're going to write that tech approach. Then they're going to cost that tech approach and send it over the fence shortly thereafter. And it nine times out of 10 throws the price completely out of whack. Again, to Jeff's point, happening way too late in the process um, to be able to remedy that and, and supply that final proposal to the government. So what are some of the relationship aspects, communication aspects between these companies that can help avoid some of those introduction of risks during the process? Uh, great, great question. Um, and I'm a strong believer of don't send anything until that teaming agreement is signed uh, by both parties um, because things fall through all the time. It happens every single time and uh, someone gets a little too happy. They send over pricing or whatever it might be and it breaks your negotiation tactic. Um, it can ruin your ability to negotiate guaranteed work, share, whatever you might be pushing for on the contractual side. So Definitely wait until you have a teaming agreement and make sure that before you send anything that there is a teaming agreement or some kind of MOU between you and the two companies um, to make sure that you can exchange that information. I know there's different legal opinions on teaming agreements, but I think whenever you have something in writing, it's better than, you know, well, we had dinner and we agreed that I was going to give you, you know, 49 percent work share on this effort. So. Um, best practices there is, again, start early. I, I know that sounds like, okay, well, what if we didn't find out about it until just last minute? Um, and, you know, in communication, you know, depending on how many teaming partners you have, be very clear about expectations. Um, I used to do proposal management. So I used to work with large teams, uh, we used to work with international teams. So those three o'clock calls, you know, they happen. You have to be awake. You have to go through their edits. You have to explain what might have changed in an amendment. Um, it, but the, the key there is, is to have constant communication and make sure that people can meet the deadlines and they understand the scope of work that they're doing. So again, the compliance matrix, the annotated outline, making sure you have your gray matter from the solicitation in that annotated outline so you don't lose sight of what you're supposed to be writing is going to be really important all across the board of people writing uh, the proposal. The, the other piece I think is, is uh, remember it's a group project. Uh, we all hated group projects. <laughs> when we were in school, there was always, you know, you, you know the dynamics in a group project. There's two or three people doing everything. Everybody else is waiting until the last minute. Um, so if you are the prime, if you're leading the effort, you are that one person doing everything. So be prepared. You know, you're going to get different fonts. You're going to get different line spacing. You might get that double space after a period from a few people that you're going to have to correct. Um, but you have to know that you're going to take charge. 
and build yourself a buffer for all of that information. When it comes to pricing, again, be very clear what you're asking your subcontractors to price. If you reach out to them um, and tell the, tell your small business that they need to provide you a proposal with an estimate that's cost plus, automatically panic. There's going to be panic on the other side. They're going to be scared to call you because they don't want to lose the opportunity. Things things will just it's it's uh it's like the uh, gif with SpongeBob and Patrick and they're running and their arms are in there. That's really what's happening on the other side of that email. Um, you know, make sure like, oops, sorry, we sent the wrong file. Please make sure that based on our agreement, like here's the pricing template that we're going to provide. If you want something to come back to you the way to make it easier for you, provide templates. It does take time. It is a pain to create those templates, make sure everything is in order. But trust me, everything will come in last minute. And if it's not formatted the way you need it to, you will be up all night. (laughs) trying to figure out the formulas, trying to figure out how it's all going to work together and trying to put it all in into one document and you will go cross-eyed. Um, and most likely you'll miss something compliance wise and nothing is worse than having your entire proposal get rejected because of a compliance issue, not even a substantial, like you could, can't perform the work issue. It's, hey, you forgot this one thing in compliance. It, it stings and, it's, and you will never forget the first time it ever happens to you. It's so true. And then you're terrified every other time after that. And it it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy at that point when you have so much pressure and stress at the end. <clears throat> a, quality control is not the last thing that you're worried about. Compliance is. And so either you're going to submit a compliant proposal, um, fully well established and everything, but it's not going to look good. Or you're going to submit a quality proposal that is either uncompliant or riddled with, with risk. Um, you know, those two things can't go hand in hand. You have to complete the compliance before you can take the time on the quality control. So Ryan, Kyle, again, from your, from your other side of the coin perspective, where do you see um, these tripping points play out in the acquisition process? How does it make executing a contract dif- difficult? How does it make negotiating the final value of a contract difficult? What What happens in in the last few days before award, that, that you can almost tell that these relationships have have established themselves in this way. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll share. I mean, from my DCMA experience, right? It, uh, and I think uh, Jeff brought this up earlier. Like we've, it's very. I don't even say common, but it is. It's sad to say that like the prime contract proposal price, you get the whole you know cost volume. You look at the the line item for the subcontractor. Let's call it uh, twenty million dollars. Right. And then you open the subcontractor volume and it's 18 and you're like, okay, what number is it? And then you read the the primes price analysis on that 20 million dollars and they say they think it should be 19. So I'm like, okay, you you have a proposed number in your proposed cost volume to me that isn't what you think it's going to cost. And it's not what the subcontractor said it's going to cost and and, and use those numbers. So let's actually call it like eight million. Uh, just to add to the confusion, right? So let's say it's a DCA audit, you're over $100 million, whatever that is. Um, and now that subcontractor is like 8 million or 9 million, right? That's under DCA's threshold. So they're sending it over to DCMA, a whole different agency to do a review of that subcontractor. And then they're like, wait, stop. You can't actually start work because I need to get clarification from the from the prime or from the sub on what, what actual value are you reviewing? Um, and people kind of put their arms in the air and wonder why it takes nine months to do an audit. Um, so I, I've seen it firsthand. It's not even nine months of audit work. It's seven months of figuring out what price we're looking at to evaluate and and, and then two months of work. So that's my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, you know, the time spent up front, right? I mean, what's the, what's the cliche? Measure twice, count or count, measure twice, cut once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, guys. Yeah, just following on from that, and I'll kind of work backwards. Um, so where I've seen it is, you know, Ryan nailed it in terms of DCAA or DCMA audits is if you're getting a ton of questions that you're having to field about the cost volume, the basis of estimate, there is real lag there. And we're, we are desperately waiting for this major award, but we have to complete this audit. Now, I'll, let me be really clear. DCAA, DCMA will always have questions. I'm not denying that. But if you have a basis of estimates that's contradictory, that's ambiguous, they might send 60 questions your way instead of 20. So there's real kind of um, impacts when it comes to time to award. So 
it goes back to, I think, um, you know, Dolores and Jeff mentioning these basis of estimates, these cost volumes, are they readable? Have you read it? Have you had time to read it? Does it make sense to you? Um, so it's always easier said than done. You know, we're always rushing kind of for the bus, but make sure you read that. If it doesn't make sense to you, it's not going to make sense to your customer. Um, so work in that buffer to Dolores's point. Um, the other thing I love is the simple takeaway, send them a template. Less excuses if they don't give you what you want, if you make it as easy on them as possible. If a SOW is amended, if an RFP is amended, and you run that comparison report, send it to your sub or to your teaming partner. Don't assume they're going to do that. Great, simple takeaway. Um, and then the other thing I was thinking of is to that group project dynamic, to Dolores's point, you know, could you work in certain incentives? Hey, subs, hey, teaming partners, if you get me your cost volume by this date, let's say two weeks early, can you work in some dollars into your bid and proposal budget to incentivize earlier submissions from your subs and teaming partners? Now, it needs to be to a certain quality, but what gets incentivized gets done. And maybe that helps get it to the point where, yeah, well, I, they gave it to me a night before it's due, so I don't really have time. Thank goodness it's here. Let's chuck it in. We're going to send it Ryan's way and whoops. There's a $2 million discrepancy. Um, so yeah, I could go on, but those are kind of my thoughts right off the cuff. Yeah, and we're coming up in, on time, but I wanted to you know, touch upon, because you, you mentioned it and, and Jack made a comment in, in the Q&A. Those templates, A, they do make life easier. They, they're hard to set up up front, but you know what you're getting on the back end. And also they are auditable. <laughs> so it helps in, in the original topic that we talked about. So this has been a wonderful conversation. We've got a few minutes open for questions. So I wanted to um, enable Chloe to turn us back over to get some Q&As out. Yes, um, we do have one question. Um, the question is, shouldn't it be a best practice that any data call or compliance issue be accompanied by either a template or an example to enable an apples to apples reply? Yeah, so true. Jeff, do you want to add any commentary to that? Uh, yes. No. Uh, so, so, yeah. No. Uh, templates help. Uh, you know, the government in recent years have done a really good job of providing a pricing template for everyone to use. So that was my nightmare as the uh, cost evaluation team guy. You know, I'd have five different proposals done in five different ways based on contractors approved account estimating practices and putting it all together to put them side by side was such a pain. Now we've invented the spreadsheet, which now contractors all hate the government for. Is like, oh, crap. Now I got to fit in my outputs into this input that the government wants. And so it's created a different kind of headache, which also just means that there's more risk of errors being made. Um, mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, to, to, to the questioner's point, yeah, it makes it so much easier. You know, how much do you, do, do you charge for a senior systems engineer? You can easily check it across the board and see if anyone sticks out for some reason, and then you can ask more questions or delve a little bit deeper into the basis of estimate. So same thing for the compliance matrices. Thank you, Dolores, for saying that. Um, not just a technical uh, uh, best practice, it's a cost volume best practice. Checking all those boxes, almost every section M I read says, you know, if the contractor doesn't, doesn't give us enough information to give any confidence in the pricing data that, that we provide, we can kick you out of this competition. So it doesn't say it exactly like that, but that's what that's the implication. So don't be that contractor. Uh, so yes, templates for all all parties involved. Oh my gosh, please do that. Perfect. And then we just had one more question, or technically two more questions come through. Um, so the first one is, where do you get the list of contractors, agent subcontractors, and then where do you get pricing? Might need a little more detail there, Ruby and. Maybe the question is like, how do you find people to team with? You're trying to find a good teaming partner. You know, are you doing market research like a contracting officer? Or are you using some tools that are out there? Absolutely. Market research, um, the DSBS from the SBA. Obviously, Sam, you can get some of that information as well. Um, but it is important, I think, from that pricing perspective, how do you get pricing? That is a broad ended question. But how do you get to the talent of strategically pricing, if I can infer you know, that's a skill set in and of itself, you know, and, and not all CEOs and small businesses are equipped to that degree of detail. As we talked about today, 
There are so many government legal FAR requirements that you have to be situationally aware of and an expert in. This isn't this isn't a jack of all trades type of area. You need a contracting specialist. You need a, a pricing specialist. You need somebody who understands what could be audited as your in, oops, excuse me, hit my laptop there. Got a little excited. As your internal controls. Um, so I think, you know, if I could sum that question up with, you know, look big, look broad, use your network. Absolutely. Learn from that network, as Kyle talked about originally. You know, nobody needs to learn these lessons more than once. Um, and it's better if you've learned it from somebody else than firsthand experience, especially when it comes to these things that can be major, major risks for your company and its in its successful endeavors as government contractors. So hopefully we wrap that one up. Good job, Marsha. Thank you. I think the p- final parting word is you can never start early enough. And that wraps up this episode of the Optimize Podcast. A big shout out to our amazing host, Marsha Watson. And a big thank you to our guests, Ryan Connell, Dr. Dolores Kachina Messina, Jeff Shapiro, and Kyle Peterson. You can connect with them in the links in the description. Optimize is brought to you by Visible Thread, the RFP software for analyzing solicitations and contracts, and for creating and editing proposals. Visible Thread is used by 11 of the top 15 US government contractors. For more information, visit visiblethread.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you are listening. Stay tuned for more insightful discussions on the Optimize podcast.